Um, Tech Field Day is an event that brings together independent voices in uh, various areas of uh, enterprise tech, from uh, storage to virtualization, networking, and wireless. And um, when uh, Maru was talking about the uh, SDN Connect event, one of the things that they wanted to do, uh, I think, was to show that this really is an open, uh, an open community, open to ideas, open to um, contributions. And so they wanted us to bring our group of uh, independent folks here to uh, bring their voices to this event, which I really, uh, I really, really love because it means that you know this is not um, you know uh, corporate push down. This is what this should be. Uh, they're interested in hearing from uh, people, uh, others outside of the space of people who are trying to sell products, and that's great. So. Thank you guys once again for involving us. Thanks for involving Tech Field Day. Um, I am going to be kicking off the discussion uh, based on what we've heard today and also based on some of the thoughts of the folks in front of you. But first, um, I'd like each of you to introduce yourself, uh, maybe just say your name, your Twitter, your blog, so that we can know uh, who you are and where we can get a hold of you. So why don't you start, Ryan? I'm Ryan Adzema. Uh, Twitter handle is at radzema. And I blog at techvangelist.net. I'm Jonathan Davis. Uh, I, uh, you can find me online on Twitter at subnetwork, uh, and you can find me at subnetwork.net. I'm sorry, .me. Uh, my name is Alex Lewis. Uh, I work for Modality Systems, and you can find me on Twitter on at Alex Lewis. I'm the least creative guy up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Cook. Uh, my Twitter handle is Johnny Cook, at Johnny Cook, and my blog is John e. Cook at WordPress.com. WordPress Hi, my name is Taryn Bryson. Uh, my Twitter handle is some clown. Should be easy to remember. And I blog at blog.packetq.net. Excellent. So let's start sort of with uh, with where we started today, um, which was applications for SDN. Um, as I said uh, in during the panel and during some of the interviews, it's been interesting to me uh, watching the progress of networking field day and wireless field day over the years because I saw so much similarity between what they were trying to accomplish in networking with SDN and what wireless was trying to accomplish with controllers. Um, what happens when these things get together? Uh, what, is the, what is the use case for wired plus wireless? Who wants to jump up with that one? Well, it's looking wireless at me. Wireless. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'll just jump in with one thing to say it collapses the, you know, it collapses the complexity of the network down from, you know, ostensibly two networks to one. If you want to break it up into, into, you know, that layer, there's obviously other places where you can reduce that complexity as well. But, um, you know, there's no reason in today's world that we're running two separate, you know, infrastructures to support clients accessing the network. It just doesn't make sense, you know, sense at all. So. Especially because that's sort of the, the user uh, experience is is that wired and wireless are the same network, just different ways of getting to it, and yet that hasn't really been the case, has it? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. One of the um, one of the real issues there is you know whether it's uh, QoS or uh, pretty in, pretty much any of the the control aspects of a network. Whenever you move from that from that land to that to that wireless environment, you're going to have a completely different. Uh, completely different experience, and that that different experience is going to mean that applications perform differently. Um, Link is a, you know Link is that 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 perfect uh, you know example of that, but it, it's not just Link. It's it's any of anything else, any other client in that space, uh, in any space that's going to be really uh, sensitive to latency or roaming or some of those things that you see in a wireless network that you'll never see in a in a wired land. And you took it right to where I wanted to go. Is it's not just wireless and wireline. <laughs> It's wireless, wireline, and applications. Uh, you know, we don't have anyone from, say, Broadcom here, but they'll make the argument that uh, they're a very part, important part of that as well, as well with the Maroos of the world and also the wired manufacturers as well. At the end of the day, the end user cares about their experience, they care about their applications, but they don't necessarily need or want to know about how the network works. Well, that brings up another another thing I was going to say that, that you know, essentially the old adage that nobody buys a hammer because they need you know, a hammer, right? They buy a hammer because they need to hit a nail. Uh, and I think from the end user's point of view, that's absolutely true. The end user doesn't, you know, doesn't need to know all the details. They don't care. And, and one of the things, if you look at the trends in the industry, you know, right now with people uh, moving around so much, I mean, what are people doing in, in workspaces now? They're tearing down cubicles. They're, they're going to more open areas. 
right? People are, ex they just expect that they can fire up their laptop anywhere in the building. Just about anywhere they are, they can accomplish work and the experience is gonna be the same or, in a lot of cases, people now expect better. You know, there's companies up where I'm at, up, up in Seattle, there are companies ripping out their entire cable plans, large companies, and just say, we're not doing it anymore, it's too, you know, too costly. So uh, we have to get feature parity across wireless. So yeah, we, heard, we heard some specific <coughs> use cases this morning as well. And, um, you know, one of those that was really interesting, uh, well, you mentioned, um, you know, ripping out the wireless and, and so on. Um, universities is, is one of the use cases we heard a lot about this morning. Um, does anybody have any personal experience with dealing with the universities, uh, university access or that sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, I, I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I managed the university <laughs> network for several years and... I do think that integrating SDN into Wi-Fi will have a lot more benefits um, in higher education, K through 12, than a lot of people um, are giving credit for right now. There's uh, so many people, so many different roles, so many different VLANs and access levels throughout a university that need to be available on every single port throughout the school. They need to be available on every access point. Everywhere you go, you need to be able to serve a student, a contractor, a professor, an administrator, uh, and give them the same experience everywhere they are, whether it's the dorm or the administrative offices. And uh, SDN OpenFlow is really going to help bridge the gaps that exist instead of just deploying a flat network everywhere. Yeah, and that's, that's really what we heard in terms of yeah, unifying wired and wireless, and especially in terms of access and um, and one of the uh, specific uh, use cases we also heard about was um, something that's really popular in universities, which is the bonjour-based services for Apple, you know, whether it's AirPlay or printers and things like that. Um, that's always been a serious problem when, once you try to build an enterprise-grade wireless <laughs> infrastructure for students because basically that breaks all those applications. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice step, um, you know, talking uh, to the guys from... Maru about it, it's, um, it, they, they did make sure to say it's 1.0, but for 1.0, it's um, still better than some of the other systems that are out there. Mm -hmm. And it's a real challenge because how those things work, you know, with the, the, how Bonjour works is, you know, you've got devices saying hello to each other, and um, if they can't say hello, then they can't connect, and then that's just, you know, right off the table right yeah. there. So... Um, you know, another area that we, uh, that we just heard about uh, was in medicine. Um, you know, certainly in my experience, doctors love their gadgets and their communication. It's kind of ironic, isn't it, that you can't turn your cell phone on in the hospital, but they're all walking around with 12 radios. But, um, you know, uh, what about that as a use case for SDN plus Wi-Fi? Something I found really interesting is actually a, a presentation I gave at uh, a large philanthropic organization last year is the importance of telemedicine. So when we start talking about very small bandwidths, uh, especially in remote areas and in third world countries, someone who wants to maybe download a new cartoon shouldn't be able to get the same access level as someone who's trying to diagnose a medical condition uh, over the wire. And SDN and the ability to, to program that out and push out policies from a central location uh, makes that a lot easier. It makes it really a lot easier across diverse networks when you don't know exactly what you're going to walk into. You don't know what layer of access you're going to be able to find in Kenya. All you need to know is that, hey, I need to get there and I'm going to have some type of internet access. Well, that was actually one of the, that was actually one of the things that, that I think probably quite a few of us have talked about for years since, since SDN really hit was, or, you know, was kind of, you know, starting to come out there was that was the killer application, right? It was steerable QoS, basically QoS on demand. I mean, you could see it from the very beginning, you know. I mean, you, you look at all the QoS and all the stuff you do on a network and, and, and the, the ability to actually do this on the fly, uh, you know, and we're starting, to see, we're starting to see some of that now. But getting back to the specific use case of medicine um, and, and all of the requirements that, that your large hospital chains and stuff like that have, I mean, yeah, every, the doctor, when I go in, you know, for a visit, the doctor walks in with an iPad, right? All the charts are right there, all the information on me. She can pull up images you know, of the last time I had anything done. I mean, they can, they can 
look at appointments, they can do all this stuff. And I mean, you know, they're tracking their, their losses, right? They're tracking their losses at the door. So everything that's expensive enough is tagged. Can't go out the door. And that's not medicine moving. is tagged, yeah. Well, the medicine, yeah, the medicine that they were, right, came up earlier. But I mean, things <laughs> like, um, you know, one of the uh, one of the most stolen things from hospitals now uh, are actually um, heart monitors. Huge. Hospitals lose millions of dollars a year on heart monitors walking out from the hospital, and then they end up on eBay or you know wherever, um, and so they're spending millions of dollars. Some of these large hospital chains to stop that, but therein lies the problem, right? You've got all these devices you're tracking wirelessly, and they're moving around, and you've got, you know. So I think SDN, yeah, we're on version one, if you will, but I mean I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Well, one of the things Space. too that came to to my mind was the aspect of security. So if you uh, if you have a unified uh, controller for both wired and wireless that allows, uh, you know, flexible, um, you know, f flexible allocation, flexible assignment of access, um, you can uh, also disallow access. You know, you can shut things down and um, and and lock things out, and that's actually, I think, as as, as important as allowing uh, activity, especially in, in an area like medicine. I think the other challenge that you get with medicine, and it kind of correlates with the challenge I deal with a lot as far as in industrial environments is, um, you know, in, in a general corporate environment, um, you know, you've got a pretty consistent uh, type of client, you know, type of supplicant. You've got a laptop that generally has a, a reasonable antenna on it. You're, you've got multiple cell phones, and uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's iOS or Android, it really doesn't matter. There's a decent antenna system and a decent radio design, and generally they're all going to be running a, you know, one of a few standard chipsets. Um, and so the, the supplicant's kind of easy to build for. But when you start looking at health, and when you start looking at industrial, in those spaces, you can have supplicants that come from, you know, from any, uh, you know, from a huge array of vendors that do everything from, you know, the, the wireless telemetry, for example, for, you know, monitoring pulse and, and you know, oxygen levels and all that other stuff um, to, I mean, you know, just the, the, the huge list of devices that were, were brought up this morning. So now each, each device has, um, you know, different types of radios, uh, interacts with the, the network just a little bit differently. You know, maybe it, it, it can, um, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's incapable or maybe it's not, maybe, you know, there's so many different levels of, of revisions and, and um, uh, uh, network control and management. Um, that now you start asking, well, how do you support it all in with with a group of with just you know a single group of policies, you know, and that type of thing. So now this allows us a little bit more um, uh, fine fine tuned uh, control for, for for those individual devices, and and you know moving that into the industrial space a little bit. Um, I, was, I was just talking to someone, and, and uh, I brought up the fact that we now have uh, in in manufacturing we have. Uh, torque tools, you know, like torque wrenches that are wirelessly connected. They run on a battery, and and you know they we, we can connect, and we know that you know this this item that was built with that torque tool, you know, based on a serial number that that's tracked on that item, received you know four bolts that were torqued to this specification, and we know that that torque tool was last um, you know calibrated at its time. But that torque tool is a torque tool. It's not a wireless supplicant, right? It's designed as a torque tool. It's not designed to download YouTube. So it, it, the, the requirements that are generally uh, met by that client um, from, from a wireless perspective is, is pretty low. The bar is low. But from a network perspective, that causes problems. And so that's the type of stuff that we can begin addressing. So do you see a point in the future where things would be like... Um maybe not fingerprinted, maybe actively uh, configured so that you would have kind of a, a, a torque tool network and that's <laughs> different, even though it's the same physical network. Right, yeah. I, I, think, I think at the very least, least what you'll see is you'll see um, policy, you know, specific policies for, you know, for those tools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the other thing that we're starting to see, and you also see very heavily in medical, is um, you think of, a, of an industrial environment, you really wouldn't expect there to be a, a huge number of wireless supplicants. But now we're getting exactly to that point where, uh, you know, in a manufacturing area, um, we're actually having to make high density deployments now because, you know, there's the torque tools and there's the scan guns and there's the, the uh, computers and the printers and, and all of these individual uh, components 
down these lines that are in a very you know tight uh, tight area, and uh, so now so now we're talking high density in industrial spaces, which is even more complex because you have so much moving metal in a lot of situations or things along those lines that are a lot harder. So yeah, absolutely, I, I believe it's going to be the, the the really refined policy per client that's going to be useful, uh, and and the ability to to tune for uh, for the uniqueness of the of the Taryn, I thought you... Uh, yeah, there. well, this actually kind of dovetails with a conversation we were having yesterday at the uh, California IPv6 task force, which was about, you know, kind of around the Internet of Things and wireless and, and, and this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, the thing came, the discussion came up that, you know, what's the ROI on, on devices being able to self-provision, right, wireless devices being able to self-provision? I mean, how many of us have... Uh, Nest thermostats, how many of us have light bulbs that have wireless chips in them, yep. the, the really cool little, you know, they're kind of gizmos, but we kind of like them. How many of us... The other day, I've got 60 Wi-Fi devices on my land. Yeah, and, and guess what? How did, you know, when you got those devices, right, what happened? You had to go in and do some amount of setup, right, for those to actually work. I mean, it was probably fairly minimal, but you don't just unwrap them, plug them in, and boom, they're on the network and good to go, right? And I think that um, I think that SDN and wireless, in conjunction with you know some technologies like IPv6, are going to allow us to, you know, really realize that, right? And you, you have to have some level of intelligence built in the network if you want any of that capability. And I think SDN is is probably, um, you know, going to be the thing that gets us there. Now, another thing we saw today that was kind of interesting was uh, the idea of using uh, not using SDN to push configurations down, but using the presence of SDN, the presence of these controllers to be able to collect metrics about an environment. And that was, uh, you know, that, that's something that I really hadn't thought about either, because I always think of it as, uh, as a way to push configurations out. But I don't think about it the fact that that means that your configurations are centralized, and then you can query them for various uses, you know, just, you know, for performance, but as well as, you know, other things like security and, and so on. It makes troubleshooting a lot easier. I, I joke with folks, I deal with a lot of sysadmins and a lot of networking groups that don't often get along, and I said, SDN, it's the first time you guys are ever going to talk to each other. Uh, <laughs> because it, there's only comes a lot less of this. Everything becomes clear as day right where the problem is, how to troubleshoot it, and how to work together to solve the problem, as opposed to spending you know, days saying, well, it couldn't possibly be a network issue. Well, my servers look fine. Um, nobody likes that conversation. Right. And, and, and it's also, you know, it's, uh, from our perspective, from the weak environment, it's a way to get you know, the, the, the foreign client's data of what's going on. And, and, have some meaning way, meaningful way of telling the network environment, hey, you know, we've got a weak area or whatever. Um, and so down the road, as a, you know, maybe they can dynamically change that, um, it's a huge boon for, you know, if, if, I, if I consider myself an application uh, customer um, of the network, uh, anything to help, you know, facilitate better experience for my customers is a huge deal. Yeah, you start looking at client health versus call health as a link. You say, all right, if you know, client health's high, call health is bad. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things you can extrapolate from getting those two data sets together. So, um, you know, another thing uh, that, we, that we've spent a lot of time on today is um, interoperability. Um, and I was just talking uh, with Dan from ONF about this as well. Um, all this falls apart if we can't keep the companies working well together. Um, now, a lot of that has to do with the, the will of the various product companies in the space, but frankly, a lot of it comes on you guys in terms of demanding and pushing and supporting for, uh, open networking, real open networking. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, how, how can you do this? How can other people uh, support interoperability? I think that that is going to be one of the most difficult parts. Um, unfortunately, wireless is the one area in technology where interoperability isn't a word. Um, you know, everyone runs the same technology back to their controllers. Everyone presents the same 802.11 specs to the clients, but you put two of them in the same room and they're going to fight. Um, and that's actually something that came up at Wireless Field Day this last uh -huh. time. We were talking about the same thing. The wireless engineers at this point are very practical and they very, and they very much say, there is no such thing as a heter heterogeneous wireless network. And that's really sad, you know? Yep. There, there are specs that have been built. There are, um, you know, ratified, um, there, there's ratified technologies out there for interoperable mesh networking, 
you know, everything out there, but nobody's implemented it because who has the incentive to say, um, you know, mine may not be as good for bridge links, so use my network for client access, but for bridge links, bring in the other vendor. They don't want to let someone else in the door. Um, you know, it may be something that never happens. It may be something that once it starts, it kind of uh, snowballs. Um, but uh, any, any way it goes, it's going to be a battle um, on the wired side getting the SDN incorporated because even within SDN, there are factions. Uh, so the wireless vendors are going to pick one and they're going to stick with it. Uh, so we need to see some ratification on that side before we see wireless start adopting it properly. It's going to take the Cisco's and the HP's as leaders in the industry to say, hey, we've got, we've got the mind share, we've got the customer base, we're going to do it and we're not going to falter from that. Yep. And everyone else will fall into line. Well, it seems like HP's pretty, been pretty progressive so far, no? They've been pretty progressive, but how, how much are they going to keep a generic, open, interoperable flavor versus something that says, you know what, we think we can tweak it this way and make it a little bit better, but all of a sudden it doesn't play nice with right, everyone right. else. And that's not just a risk from them, that's sure. a risk for every Everybody. open standard everywhere. Um, you know, I was at a storage conference earlier this week and they, we were talking about the same thing with uh, OpenStack Swift. Um, you know, the, the fact that you've got a standard protocol that uh, is only standard as far as sort of the middle of the road, and once you get uh, a little bit more diverse, uh, there's no commands for that. Well, even in open standards, um, everyone uses an open standard for one thing or another, and then they add some special sauce that makes it, you know, they're using the it's open standard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mine's yeah. better. The, the no, standard it's it's is there at the base, but it's, but it's no longer interoperable with yeah. the other standard-based systems. Well, how many people have tried to set up, you know, have, have I mean, gone through the experience of setting up IPsec site-to-site -site tunnels between security devices or setting up SIP trunks between voice providers. Um, you know, ostensibly all standards, right? But, yeah, <laughs> yeah you <No>. know. <laughs> the thing I'm worried about a little bit, is, and we were talking about at lunch, is, you know, in the open source world, we tend to see a lot of fragmentation, you know, historically, right? I mean, since the since the early 90s, I mean, it's just, been, and before, really, it's, it's just always been the case. And I thought, well, what happens if you get, you know, a controller based on a certain code revision, and you have northbound APIs of one type or another, you have southbound APIs of another type, you have your applications written to some particular target, you have your underlying switch hardware, you know, whatever, router hardware, whether there's white box or some, you know, other vendor. And that's all perfect and that's great and somebody architected it and life is good and you start going through incremental upgrades, right? Which nobody does forklift upgrades at the whole network, so you're going to do incremental upgrades. What happens a year or two out when the open flow standard is now 1.6 and the white box switch that you have, the silicone doesn't support, you know, this over here and that app was targeted and you start getting even more fragmentation than we see today. I think that's actually a really big challenge on the horizon. Um, you know, for, for the whole, I mean, the whole movement, the whole SDN movement, so. So, um, do we have any uh, questions from the audience for this group? <clears throat> While we're waiting for that, um, I wanted to warn you guys, I'm gonna ask you guys to sum up in uh, what one thing that you, that you learned uh, here today. Uh, anybody? All right. Okay, uh, we'll get you the microphone, sure. I hoped that you did. <laughs> Here's our ferociously nerdical engineer. So, uh, you know, like uh, there is one concept we did not talk about today is the VLANs, right? And uh, with the SDN, I do see VLANs go away, right? Uh, how do you see that play a role? Right? VLANs playing a role in the future world. I think personally for me, if you move to, I mean, as a, as a long-time network engineer, if you move to V6, um, there's probably an argument to be made. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about V4, I think, you know, controlling, you know, failure domains in general, whether it be routing or, you know, anything is probably problematic. But, I mean, just at first glance, right, hadn't thought of it, so. 
If you're applying policies directly to the devices dynamically across the network, I mean, at that point, it becomes tags, you know, logical tags. It's no longer uh, a logical VLAN. You're just identifying a policy on a client. <clears throat> what purpose would a VLAN serve, um, whether they go away completely or uh, they, we change the way we think about them, that I don't know, but we're definitely going to be looking more at client policies uh, as opposed to um, logical network layouts. All right. We got another one here. Several of you spoke of interoperability between different SDN controllers and the special sauce. Um, do you think, how, how soon do you think it'll get to a point where, like the Wi-Fi Alliance kind of forced interoperability at the basic level? So you could turn on a device and at least it'll connect. You make it different experiences, but today when you open a laptop or tablet, it connects to anyone's Wi-Fi. How soon will that happen? Yeah, on the back end, you mean? Yeah, yeah. on the back end, yeah. That's actually what I'm hoping is going to come out of the IMTC meeting in uh, a few weeks. <laughs> so uh, ask again in three weeks. <laughs> and, and by the way, that, uh, to answer that question as well, we had a, a discussion on this at Wireless Field Day last time. And there again, the delegates were very, very disappointed in the fact that there is standardization for client access, but there's really nothing on the back end of the network. And um, hopefully this, you know, I have some hope that this might help. Anybody else? Yeah, even if the wireless controllers or access points aren't talking directly to each other, maybe <coughs> SDN will allow the transfer of information mm -hmm. between them. Yeah, even if they don't have gap. the same controller protocol, at least they have the same protocol talking to the controllers. Yeah, yeah. normalization. Uh, and, and, and that information can then be bridged through SDN as a mechanism. And that, that's exactly my hope for this. Um, I mean, we were actually talking earlier, and, and one of the things that we said was, to some extent, Wireless has been doing software-defined networking for a while. When you really look at a controller, it looks a lot like a, you know, an SDN controller. The fact that you've got an overlay between your access point and that controller. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, similarities, at least, between uh, traditional, um, uh, well, more recent, I should say, controller-based wireless, right, and, and software-defined networking. There's, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so what this, I feel like what this is doing by combining the open flow with that, uh, that mentality and that experience, I'm hoping that we do exactly that. We allow the open flow to provide that interoperability between, you know, whatever's happening inside the network. And, and you know, I'm perfectly fine with the controller still managing that AP. But I, I need that interoperability, and that's that's what I that's what I'm hoping we see. That's that's what I want to bring out. Of and this. maybe in the future we see an SDN controller that talks directly to APs right. of any vendor, and you know then we can get that. In. If everyone's bringing it back to SDN, and the you know maybe they they do throw in a little bit of special sauce that'll work with their access points, but it'll still control any other open flow access point. Or open air, or whatever they're called. Okay, so instead of instead of open flow to the controller to the AP, you just have open flow to the AP. Right. Now that would be interesting. So it's still a controller-based system. You've just now merged it into an open standard. Right. Yeah. And 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 that allows you know I mean there's always going to be the need for comparative you know that that uh, uh, you know this are, this is our competitive edge. So that pushes that competitive edge back into the AP. Um, you know where where we can begin focusing more on uh, you know the. Uh, intelligence that's built in there. I mean, obviously, there's you know, uh, you know, some APs we're now starting to see, uh, you know, layer seven, uh, you know, visibility and things along those lines inside the AP that we certainly have never seen before, and it's that type of thing that we can push into the AP now, talking open flow back to you know a, a, an open flow controller and and really kind of expand on. It. So, 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 do you see the value creation more on the northbound interfaces from a from a from a value creation and industry as it evolves, will it be all on the northbound interfaces, policy management applications, and everything below becomes generic? Um, I, I can't really say. I, I don't know. It, it, because it's, it's a very abstract concept right now. It's not something that 
I think we'll see for a very long time if we do see it, um, because our, I mean, is Maru going to open up their access points and allow Cisco to start controlling them? It's it's one of those things that, um, you know, a couple companies are going to have to decide that they're going to do it right out of the gate, um, and and kind of give that up and change the game. And the way it happens is it may just be policy. It may be that there's still a separate component for gathering application visibility. Um, you or it know. may never happen. I mean, exactly. we may end up with open flow to the controllers, and that's good enough. Well, and I think maybe to, to go back to your question a little bit as well, I think it's easy for us to say yes. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, because we're engineers. And we have to deal with that, right? So we, so I, I would say yes right away, in a lot of cases as far as value add, because, you know, I want to be able to manage, you know, things easily. Uh, from a user perspective, though, um, I think that's where things get a little, little more gray and where it's not as easy to answer. Well, you know um, what I would, I would just really quickly add to that too is, I mean, I remember, you know, when Linux came out and all the, you know, kind of stuff that was going on with that. <clears throat> You know, I was pretty big into that at the time, and, and it was going to disrupt Microsoft, and it was going to disrupt Windows on the desktop, and we were going to have this and that and the other. And, and, you know, of course, that never happened, right, looking back with the benefit of, of you know, what, 22 years of, of, you know, hindsight. But look what it did do. I mean, look at what Linux became, right? It's, it's embedded in everything. It runs, you know, uh, operating systems on routers. It runs, I mean, it's, you know, running stuff that's, you know, in satellites. It's, it's just, you know, it's incredible what, what happens. So I think that the, the thing with OpenFlow is we're all working, and wireless and things like that, we're all working to steer and, and sort of try and, and navigate. I mean, Maru's doing that, different companies are doing that. Um, you know, 10, 15 years out, we may not end up with what we think, you know, we're steering towards today. Uh, but that, that uh, actually leads me to something that I heard Dan say as well that I really liked, and that's that you know you can't drive everything ahead. You can't be out in front of everything. You can't drive everything forward. Sometimes you have to let things. He didn't say this exactly, but I'm putting words into his mouth. Sometimes you have to <laughs> let things drive themselves for a while and see where it goes before you decide what the standard should be. Yeah. So. Uh oh, two questions. We have to, we have we have to wrap up pretty quick, but uh, we, we'll take a couple. Oh, it should be pretty quick. So, Moni, what's the biggest stumbling block to the actual adoption of SDN in production? Anybody stumbling uh, blocks? Stability, maturity, maturity. Yeah, people who have a really big problem to solve right now, and, and I can name a few companies, large media companies, for example, that are you know have problems to solve, um, are going to adopt quickly and they'll adopt the first thing that solves their pain point. Um, everybody else, right, your enterprise, your, your, your you know, mid-tier enterprises and down, um, they're going to sit back and wait. I mean, we get questions all the time, like, what do you think about NSX? What do you think about ACI? What do you think about this company? That can, you know, people are interested, but they're not, they're not going to yeah. do anything drastic unless it solves their problem right now. Follow on, so can you define maturity? Well, right now, right now you have, you have overflow. No. <laughs> You're supposed to say no, yeah, yeah. You, you have open flow, and uh, for for enterprises, for small, medium enterprise, for universities, um, what is it truly going to solve? Why should they invest in it now? It's not mature. There there are solutions. There are lots of possibilities, but there's nothing out of the box that's really going to fix a problem that cannot be fixed any other way with the existing system. So is it maturity or is it lack of application? Well, I think as it matures, the applications will present. Mm -hmm. it's lack of interop, too, is what we're interoperability right now, too. I mean, there's only so many vendors, like for, for example, that, that SDM even works with their controllers. So until that's more of a you know, widespread use, it's of no use until I can't go to management and say, hey, let's look at doing this because it would mean changing our access points. That's not going to happen, right? It may, and maybe it will, but, you know, that's, that's the... Right. Well, I'm a right now. Well, here's the here's the marketing thing. Right? You have to you have to frame it. I mean, this is something that the marketing people at OEMs and, and, and different folks have to really get behind because, so, and I'm going to go back to this again. But yesterday, IPv6 task force, right? Everybody thinks the killer application for v6 is address depletion, and the reality is nobody that's in the IPv6 world gives cares about address depletion. That's not the the thing. You know, when you look at V6, you start looking at things like, you know, when you're talking to customers, right, to try and find that use case, I mean, one of the things you bring up is security. It's like you realize every operating system out there, you know, has it turned on by default, it prefers it, 
By the way, you have no IDS IPS recognition of that right now. Your firewalls aren't stopping it. People can tunnel it. What about your PCI compliance? You know, so I think that with with SDN, I mean, that's a little bit of the maturity we need too. Is is the discussion has to be framed better than just SDN is cool, and and you know, you, there's got to be a lot more sort of sort of maturity behind the message. And there yeah. needs to be a lot more network engineers. And we've got a lot of smart people here that know it inside and out. You go to the average company and ask their network engineer, hey, so I need you to take our network, get rid of all the VLANs, and deploy SDN over the weekend. And they go, what? <laughs> Can I go take a class? Can I take a boot camp? Can I do anything? The skills aren't there in the market. Uh, they're very, at least they're very limited today. Well, and I, I would actually go a step further than that. Uh, last week, I was part of Network Field Day, and we, we spoke to a lot of companies who were talking about OpenFlow and were talking about SDN and one of the things you know one of the discussions that, that uh, we had was there are a lot of people who have a lot of companies a lot of large companies that have major designs and major plans with open flood but even they are saying you know this is where we're going with it not this is where we're at with it yeah. Yeah. and when you when you're looking at you know major vendors who that's their message I think to me that says you know we're getting there but we're not there yet so we're not there yet. Unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, I have to, <laughs> sorry about that. I do have to cut it off. It was a great, great discussion. Uh, thank you guys very much. Um, thank each of you as well for joining us here in uh, Sunnyvale for this event. Um, I hope this was interesting and educational. Um, those of you uh, in the audience and those of you watching online as well, I hope you enjoyed uh, SDN Connect today. Again, I'm uh, Stephen Foskett. Uh, you can find out more about me and about uh, Tech Field Day. Just go to techfieldday.com. And um, Maru, I know, has a, a page, Maru uh, Networks uh, slash SDN, um, which is easy enough to remember. Um, so thank you very much for, for bringing us in.